Uh, let's bring into the conversation right now our friend, national security analyst uh, and retired Marine intelligence officer, co-host of the Strat podcast, Hal Kempfer, uh, joining us for a special uh, Sunday conversation here. Hal, good to see you. Thanks for being with us on your weekend. Uh, I know uh, you and I spoke on Thursday, so uh, we have not spoken on a lot of these developments as well. But you were listening there to Netanyahu uh, offline. Um, what did you make of his message? Uh, he obviously felt compelled to come out in the wake of the news we got Friday, Hal, that three Israeli hostages were mistakenly and inadvertently killed by IDF forces. We're learning more about that exchange, about that confrontation, uh, and he lamented their loss. How do you think the Netanyahu government is going to come back after this hostage situation, the killings of these hostages, Hal? Do you think they lose some moral legitimacy in the wake of this on the world stage? Andrew, it really hits their credibility. You know, they've been saying they've been very precise, very careful about what they've been hitting, that they're, uh, they've been using the term precision or precise uh, uh, targeting uh, of everything they've done in Gaza. And then near have a situation where early, uh, certainly under international law, the law of war, you have individuals that, <clears throat> that basically came up with a white flag, the flag of surrender, uh, took, off their, took off their shirts so that they could see there was no explosive vest, this wasn't some sort of trick, and, and yet the IDF took them under fire, and, and they killed them. And it turns out they were hostages who had somehow made their way uh, to a situation where they could potentially uh, be free, and, and then at the last moment they were killed by friendly fire. And it really brings into question the entire narrative of how, how careful the IDF troops are in terms of uh, of their targeting, because there's been these, uh, you know, global condemnation of Israel for the number of civilian casualties that have been killed, and this doesn't help uh, Israel in terms of responding to that. And I might mention this also coincided with a sniper that apparently was attacking, uh, or basically was targeting what I'm sure the sniper thought were uh, Hamas in a Christian church and ended up killing a mother and her daughter. Right. And and that brings in a lot of questions because when you're talking about sniper, that's a very, you can't get more precise in the battlefield than a sniper. So it brings in a lot of questions across the board, which is what exactly is, is the IDF? What have they been trained to do? What are their rules of engagement uh, in Gaza? And, and, and if that's the case, how did these things happen? Yeah. You know, uh, Hal, also too, uh, on the kind of, opposite end of this, when you talk about the hostages, it's such a psychic blow to Israel, not only October 7th, but then, you know, the seven day ceasefire where you had almost 100 hostages returned back to Israel from Hamas captivity, and then uh, 130 plus still remain. But then all this week, I don't know if you noticed this, it seems like each and every day we got news that IDF forces uh, found the body of a dead hostage, the body of a dead hostage too. Uh, Israeli soldiers, their bodies were found on Friday as well. And then we got the news about these three Israeli hostages uh, being fired upon and killed inadvertently in this horrible mistake here. Um, you have all of that going on, but it does seem like there is some glimmer uh, that talks could be ongoing, that some of these intelligence chiefs uh, from regional partners are about to meet to talk about the hostage question yet again. Have you seen those reports? Andrew, yes, I have, and it was very interesting. You may recall that earlier in the week, uh, that the uh, or earlier last week, I should say, that the head of Mossad was supposed to travel over to uh, Qatar uh, to work with his uh, Qatari interlocutors and in talking to Hamas about possibly another exchange of uh, of hostages for prisoners or detainees, and then all of a sudden it was turned off, and at that point, uh, basically, it was. The, the 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 what was put out was that there was nothing to discuss that Hamas was being intransigent or that this would not be fruitful and it was kind of sending a message uh not only uh to Israel but also sending a message very clearly to Hamas that this was not that they were not coming to the table as honest brokers and you have to remember during during the entire quote ceasefire that took place Hamas never, never, never stood by its commitment to allow the International Red Cross to physically visit, to meet with the hostages that were being held. And this has always raised a big question, which is 
how many hostages do they actually have? Did they kill a number of these hostages or let them die otherwise, which is essentially the same as killing, um, uh, during the interim, uh, during the time of their capture and where they are now? And and this kind of reinforces that concern uh, in Israel and elsewhere that, that these hostages may not be in, in good shape. Now, right. with that said, uh, as of today, uh, apparently uh, the head of Mossad is talking with his Qatari interlocutors. It wasn't clear if he was talking to them virtually, but it sounded like he might be in Doha. And it's not like he clears his travel itinerary with me, so I don't know for sure. <laughs> uh, but it sounds like he's in Doha and he's talking with them. And and there is a certain element of truth in, in everything. You know, negotiations are are not just what you say. You know, as Teddy Roosevelt said, speak softly and carry a big stick. Well, yeah. right now, the IDF is a mighty big stick. And, and what they've been doing sets the context for which negotiations take place. And this puts Hamas in a position of they may be able to or may be willing to concede more because they know where this is going. They can see the writing on the wall. They're also seeing their own Hamas terrorists surrendering in droves to the IDF. And that's right. something that we weren't seeing before the uh, ceasefire took place, certainly not during the ceasefire. And now we're seeing it. So they're starting to see the the, the dissembling, if you will, of uh, cohesion within the Hamas ranks, uh, along with the other groups that are involved. And with that, Israel would probably hope to capitalize on that in any negotiation going forward. Yeah. You know, Hal, just back to the uh, horrible situation. Um, you know, these three Israeli hostages were wandering around Gaza. You could presume maybe that they escaped. They were looking for the border with Israel. Maybe they were looking for help. They were uh, apparently one of them had a white flag in their hand here. Uh, we have their images as well. And I would venture to say, Hal, do you think the IDF and Israel has really handled this appropriately and by the books, launching an internal investigation, being so transparent and forthcoming about what exactly happened? I've been asking some of our you know, friends and experts like yourself, Hal, you know, whether or not these IDF forces you know, who, who did this, will they face harsh penalties here? Um, but it seems like Israel is doing this by the book. And you can make the argument, Hal, would Hamas have done the same? Oh well, Hamas would—they don't do anything by the book. They have no book. They—they—they they, uh, they violate international law. For them to to kill their own would be just you know Tuesday. They wouldn't really care, and they certainly wouldn't have any great moral angst uh, if, if they were to do something like this. Israel is different. Israel sets itself, and and it and it is on a higher moral plane, if you will. And I'm sure a lot of people would disagree with that statement. And say, oh, what's happening and what the IDF is doing. But they are they are working very hard to comply with the international laws of war, with the uh, human international humanitarian laws, and this is a clear cut mistake. Period. There's no. I mean, this was wrong. They were surrendering. They were doing everything they could to uh, new, to make sure that they didn't appear to be a threat. And those troops on the ground made a mistake. Now they have to do a full investigation. Because and and it and it's the right thing they're doing is being very transparent. If they weren't transparent, that would be something we'd be talking about, which was uh, you know uh, that would be stupid. Period. Right. I mean, there's just nothing else to say. If you didn't do it in a very transparent way, they would get hammered from all sides, especially within Israel. So they have to do it transparently. But but with that, they they need to look at what was done. Was this just the troops disregarding? Uh, orders disregarding the rules of engagement, which sometimes does happen. But then you get into command climate. Uh, what was going on? Why were they doing that? What would have inclined them to fire in a situation where they shouldn't have fired? Then also, they're going to take a hard look all the way up the chain of command to say, hey, look, was there something that would have uh, mitigated their compliance with uh, the Geneva Convention and the laws of war? I see. And, and so that then that could go very far. Uh, I don't know where this will end up, but I've seen things like this. They start at the uh, you know the squad level, so to speak, where the shooting took place, and they get right up to the senior officer level because they find out that something was going on. Some commander gave an order that would have uh, kind of loosened their discipline, if you will, in okay. terms of adherence to these uh, uh, regulations, orders, uh, and certainly the Geneva Convention. 
And if that's the case, then I think they'll let the chips fall where they may. I don't anticipate this this is going to be done in the next few days or the next few weeks. These types okay. of inquiries take a long time. No, there's, they really, really do. You're so right. Um, Hal, I want to put this uh, video up here because the IDF released this, I believe, today. Uh, so from what I understand, I'm going to drop this uh, because this is what it is. This is Hamas footage recovered by IDF intelligence, Hal, of this massive tunnel uh, kind of burrowing right in to Israel from Gaza. This is right by the border, uh, and it is a massive tunnel. And you can see there Hamas footage obtained by Israeli intelligence. There's like three or four people can fit elbow to elbow, shoulder to shoulder there in the width of that tunnel, Hal. And, and you have this dovetailing with the news we got on Friday um, that Israel has agreed to open one of these border crossings from Israel into Gaza to let in more humanitarian assistance and aid. It's known as the Karem Shalom crossing. Uh, so that hasn't been done before since October 7th. And I think that's quite significant too, uh, knowing what Israel has gone through that they are now opening on their side a border crossing here. And then we get this video today of this massive tunnel complex. Um, you know, we knew tunnels and the tunnel complex existed, kind of a secondary Gaza underneath the primary Gaza here, Hal. But what do you make of that? I, I think uh, seeing is believing. Yeah. Uh, we knew these tunnels were there. Uh, by the way, I wouldn't po I'd point out, yeah, you could put a few people in there, but the other thing that that tunnel was so large and it went back, it was reinforced with concrete, uh, steel, all sorts of things. It goes back for at least two and a half miles. I mean, this is a huge tunnel. And not only can you put lots of people in there, but more importantly, it's big enough to support vehicles. You can put a pickup truck or some smaller uh, SUV or some vehicle that you could use to do a rapid breakout, go through the fence line, go into Israel, mechanize, mobilize, kind of like the things that we saw on October 7th, where they not only went through the lines, they went through the lines in vehicles and they were able to cover a lot of terrain very quickly. That's what's so significant about this tunnel. And, and what's uh, probably even more significant is not so much whether it was used on October 7th, it's whether it's that it looks like it was prepared for another attack. And this goes to Israel's uh, reason, uh, raison d'etre, if you will, for even being there, for, for continuing the war, which is that Hamas uh, is, a, is an existential threat. They will continue to, not just them saying they're going to continue to October 7th uh, ad infinitum, but that they had actually gone to this incredible amount of uh, engineering uh, work, if you will, over a very long period of time to build a facility, to build a tunnel that would enable them to do uh, October 7th ad infinitum. And it just reinforces that whole reason why Israel is there. It's like, look, this threat is not disappearing. This is what they did. And it visually brings to what they've been saying or visually brings context to what they've been saying all along which is this massive tunnel complex is something that they have to take care of. And, and they're going to do it in a variety of ways. They've, they've been hitting them with explosives. They've been sending in uh, dogs and, and robots and, and drones. Uh, and now, of course, in the north, they've been experimenting with uh, flooding them with seawater. Right. Um, right. We'll see how this goes, but it was uh, absolutely fascinating to see what these tunnels are, are kind of all about.